All right, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Feigenbaum, joined as always by Dr. Baraki. What's going on, Austin? Hey, how you doing? Good. This episode or series of episodes is right in your wheelhouse. I can tell you're super excited. That is a devilish grin. What are we going to be talking about today? So I don't usually preemptively write out like a whole topic outline for these podcasts. Usually you come up with a few questions you want to ask and we take it from there. But um, basically injury management and lifters. Uh, it's a topic that, you know, we get hammered with questions about this all the time. Uh, I hurt this, I hurt that, or this hurts or that hurts. What do I do? And so, you know, over a long period of time of coaching, lots of coaching experience, working with various people and various injuries, uh, in all sorts of different demographics. Uh, we've kind of developed something of a, like a general approach that you can work down um, that'll really take care of the vast majority of issues, I think, uh, that are within the like the non-surgical realm. Like if you have an injury that needs surgery, like this isn't gonna fix it, right? But um, for non-surgical kind of sports medicine, you could think of it kind of deal for, uh, for lifters. I think this approach works uh, really well for the vast majority of people that I've worked with. So I thought we would get it down, get it recorded, and then hope people help us out by uh, spreading it like wildfire. So that's the idea. Let's make this thing go viral. Yes, All please right. share this. <laughs> okay, so the broad topic is injury in a lifter uh, or a client. First step in management. What's your first go-to? So the, fir- the, the place to start, as with kind of any any complaint or what we do in, in you know with our patient population is to take a detailed history is to figure out um, is to figure out what happened because the vast majority of the time you can either get the diagnosis or get extremely close to the diagnosis just from taking a history so things that we would want to know obviously where it hurts what does it feel like what kind of things exacerbate your pain how long have you been dealing with it because an injury that happened you know 3 minutes ago and you're texting your coach about it, as actually happened with somebody right before we started recording this. He was like, I tweaked my hip, Uh, what do I do? And I basically told him, I said, hey man, you know my approach to this stuff by now. Um, So so knowing, knowing whether it just happened acutely or whether it's pain that they've been dealing with for weeks or months or years, all of those kind of shift your frame of reference as to what could be going on and what your approach is gonna be. It really, uh, has dramatic implications for your for your approach to treating things. If there's radiation, or if there's kind of other associated symptoms, or the red flag symptoms associated with some things that we talk about in certain contexts, like back pain, um, so things like that. Getting as detailed of a history as possible is definitely the first step. So, so yes, yeah, so we'll go stepwise by this, because I think you know it's best to have a, like a almost a protocol or algorithmic approach to this, right? So, so the first thing we want to know is what is the chronicity? Is this this is the first time you've ever had this, never had it before, this is new, okay? And then how long ago did this start? Or if this is chronic, right? So then you go down another path of this algorithm, like what did you do about it last time? What was the natural course, um, you know? And so, okay, so let's say this is acute. So then of course you wanna know what does it actually feel like? Is it a sharp, st- you know, stabbing, nervy, you know, tingly, radiating, all these sort of characteristics. You wanna get as much information as possible so you can characterize it. So I think you said that well. Um, you know, how bad is it for real, right? Uh, and then you keep getting more and more det- detailed about this. If it's chronic, then you have to do more, even more history. You know, if the first episode of this was 10 years ago, then you kind of have to go back and say, you know, what happened or did anything happen to cause this or just come out of nowhere, right? Because if it came out of nowhere, it, it, nonspecific causes, and I think you may agree with me on this, result in non-specific treatments <laughs> being efficacious you know it's like yeah i don't really know what happened but then i went and visited this other health professional and i got better it's like yeah or you just got better yeah the natural history of most things is to get better <laughs> is to get better yeah unless you're unless you actually die so that's yeah so so we agree you get a history first um at what point do you think it's worth having a physical exam done by a trained professional and further, the second part of that question I'll make you answer is, who would be a qualified professional to actually do a physical exam? Yeah. Yeah, so, so one of the things, so I can think of a few questions we've gotten recently where somebody will tell us that they have, say, anterior shoulder pain or posterior hip pain or, you know, lateral ankle pain or something like that. And so, you know, 
just like with any other complaint, each of those will generate something of a differential diagnosis for us. So, you know, when you're thinking about anterior shoulder pain, you can have it from glenohumeral osteoarthritis, you can have it from AC joint arthritis, you can have it from all sorts of, you know, labral issues, you can have referred pain from the neck, you can have shoulder impingement syndromes, rotator cuff syndromes, all kinds of things. And so, Based on the description, thinking about what kind of activities exacerbate someone's pain, that is kind of in itself uh, something of a physical exam that can be done remotely. Like if you tell me that it gets worse when I do this, but it doesn't get worse when I do that, I can try to interpret that in terms of maneuvers that I might do to you in, in a physical exam. So that might be helpful um, as a replacement for a physical exam if I'm not able to see you in person. But if I'm not able to get really convincing kind of answers to that sort of question where it says what makes it worse um, when I'm talking to somebody remotely, then really I might get down to like a, a set of two or three possibilities and it's just like, you know, uh, I can't definitively say that this is the best, this is the best diagnosis or that's the best diagnosis. and assuming that those two different diagnoses would result in different management strategies, then I would say you have to go be evaluated. If I have it down to two different things, the answer to both of which is you need to train, then I don't really care to send you somebody to send you somewhere for further evaluation by somebody who, you know, who is qualified to evaluate and manage such things. And and so when you, to get to your next part of the question is who would be appropriate to evaluate these things? Well, the answer to that is going to sort of depend on uh, where that pathway is leading. So for example, if I have it down to two different possibilities, uh, the answer to one of which is surgery and the answer to the other is not surgery or like just kind of conservative management, right? Then somebody like a trained sports medicine person or a surgeon themselves who are trained in evaluating, assessing for this particular problem and operating on it would be the people most qualified to uh, evaluate and treat it. Now, when you go to see those people, their recommendations might be might not be the best in terms of uh, you know what you should do about it outside of their wheelhouse, like like listening to a a, a surgeon's advice for conservative management of of uh, knee osteoarthritis. Uh, in my experience, has not been the best advice that I see a lot of them give in terms of just rest, stay off it, take it easy, that kind of stuff. Sure, but of course, right. that's not really the evidence based recommendation for those things either. No. But yeah, but I think it's important to clarify, you know, the uh, cynic would say, well, if you go to see a surgeon, you know, they're going to recommend surgery nine out of 10 times because, you know, if everything, if all you have is a hammer then everything looks like a nail. However, that has not been my experience. No. It's almost as if they don't want to operate <laughs> like because they're already operating enough. Well, you know, and, and, and I don't mean that that's a general statement and you get in trouble with general statements, but. Uh, my, you know, it, it does seem like people are abiding by the Hippocratic Oath and uh, that they're, you know, ethically treating patients, those who would not benefit from a surgery, that often, you know, don't get surgery as, as much as maybe the cynic per cynical person would think that's the case. Uh, but I think if when they do go to like conservative management, then they just uh, that at that point, okay, great. That's the end of the visit. Let's go to a, <laughs> let's go to a different professional who's actually yeah, you know that's outside their expertise. Correct. Which, but that's fine though. I don't necessarily care if my surgeon is up to date on the effects of strength training on you know knee osteoarthritis. I just don't want them to say, don't strength train because it'll hurt your knee. Yeah, yeah. I think when it comes to the the, the surgeons operating a lot because they're surgeons, uh, the the reality of it is that surgeons care about their outcomes. And so if you're somebody who is going to have a really terrible outcome from their surgery, then I've seen it lots and lots and lots of times. They say, hey, I'm not going to operate on you. For example, a lot of institutions or among, um, among certain groups, they won't opt. So if you have a diabetic patient who has bad knees and they don't want to get their knee replacement, they're like, hey, if your diabetes is, is poorly controlled, we're not going to operate on you until you get it done. They, they would make a buck way faster if they just did it. But then you risk a bunch of complications, post-op infections, poor wound healing, all that kind of stuff. And then they have bad outcome on their book and they care about that. So, you know, yeah. it's complicated. Yeah, it's, it's nuanced. If you will. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think, and I agree with you. Uh, if, if a physical exam in person is going to change the management, i.e. surgical versus conservative management, or you're between two diagnoses that have two distinctly or markedly different conservative management, you know, paths, which is, which is rare, admittedly. Uh, then yes, a physical exam would be very helpful. And in that case, yes, I would recommend to either a sports medicine trained uh, family inter you know, or internist or uh, surgeon 
those, those three or, or somebody who... Uh, Probably a PM, yeah. PM&R person might be helpful P, in that yeah, situation. Yeah, PM&R, sure. sure. Uh, or a physical therapist who's really up on their physical exam skills probably works within the ortho's office or sports med clinic. Uh, so I agree with you that I would refer to a sports medicine trained either internist, primary care physician, PM&R, or surgeon. Those would probably be my the top options. A physical therapist who works within one of those offices or is very skilled with their diagnostic physical exam, I would also... Uh, do that. I would not refer to a chiropractor mainly because um, the training that goes into obtaining that degree, uh, I feel like the, the physical exam is not as sensitive and not as well trained as uh, with managing uh, those things. And, and I, there are good chiropractors. We know good chiropractors. Um, that's, this is just, these are just general statements, uh, you know, based, based on the, uh, our experience and, and then <laughs> our client's experience. So it's fun. it's interesting that our experience has been magnified by, you know, literally thousands and thousands of patient hours. And we're like, okay, so these are the general trends that we see. So yeah, I would agree that that that, that would be the, the basis for a physical exam. I do not think that if you've had pain for a week or two weeks, you need to go see your primary care doctor. And the reason why is they're not going to do anything for that unless they fall into, you know, they're well trained in this diagnostic physical exam, the sports med fellow, they're, um, you know, into into uh, training and, 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 and this sort of stuff. Otherwise, you're going to waste a copay if you have insurance or a significant amount of money to get a, a, a prescription for 800 milligram ibuprofen <laughs> at, at, at best. At, at worst, you get uh, narcotics. I could end in Robaxin or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think the same thing, uh, the same kind of general rules would apply to imaging as well. Cause we get asked a lot about this. Should I go get an x-ray? Should I go get an MRI? Stuff like that. And in the, again, this is in the absence of those kind of red flag, super concerning, scary symptoms that land people in the ER. Um, then we, you know, it, it, it's kind of similar in the sense that we, in the acute phase, you you almost never need imaging. And in fact, the guidelines, for example, for acute nonspecific or mechanical low back pain that you're not supposed to order x-rays on people for the, at least for the first four six weeks, weeks. Is it four, four to six, six weeks, six, four yeah. to six weeks. Cause it, cause it tends to get better on its own. And, uh, right. you know, you can cause harm by ordering x-rays. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can get, you can cause harm. Wait, are you just talking about the teratogen, the, uh, the ionizing radiation, how many millisieverts does it cause? So that's the, uh, the effect of the nocebo effect, which we'll talk a little bit more about a little later on. And then we'll also probably do a dedicated podcast on the topic. I think would be my, uh, interest to do something like that. Um, but, but when it comes to, so we mentioned the physical exam is useful when you're down to a couple diagnoses where when you make one diagnosis or the other, it'll change what you ultimately do for the patient. And imaging is kind of the same thing. So, you know, we get people with back pain all the time saying, Hey, my back's hurt, hurts for a long time. Should I go get back pain? And then my next question is, let's say it shows this. Are you going to oh, go, should you go get imaging on your back? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And then I said, let's say it shows something like this. Are you going to go and get spine surgery? Are you going to let a surgeon, uh, you know, cut on your, on your spine? And they almost always say, no, I'm, I've heard terrible things about spine surgery. I'd never get spine surgery. And then I'm like, okay, so why are we going to go get that thing if you, you know, if we have more conservative ways that we can, uh, that we can train around this issue and you do okay without needing to get surgery done. So that's, a, that's the imaging question as well. Yeah, there are reasons to get back imaging, but in general, mechanical low back pain is not one of them. And it's the same thing with like mechanical shoulder pain on some, on some, you know, it, it, so it, we could go through like each joint, you know, when is it appropriate to get neck imaging? And it's like, uh, so for instance, if your neck hurts and you have re repeatable uh, uh, nerve deficit, either in strength or in se uh, sensation or something like that that's repeatable and along a, a, you know, a nerve's distribution. Yeah, then that you could make a case for imaging there, right? Um, you know, uh, on your shoulder, for instance, if you have a marked decrease in range of motion that is acute with pain, plus or minus deformity, plus, you know, a handful of other things that would you'd be ruling in, this is, there's potential for surgery here, then you go get imaging. And you can go down joint by joint. And, and the bigger thing is, if there is there a nerve issue that is, that, you know, could be explained by a mononeuropathy, right? So, so one nerve that's being affected, uh, a fracture, uh, or some other sort of structural, you know, uh, uh, issue that would change your management towards surgical or, or other, then yes, you get imaging. Otherwise, it's not going to do anything for you.
yeah, yeah. It, might har- it might be harmful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super important to hammer this point home because everyone wants to. They think like something hurts. I need to go get an X-ray of it, or they'll go and they'll demand imaging or something like that. When ultimately, like you're not, you know, even even if it does show, okay, I've got arthritis in my shoulder. What are you going to do about that? You're going to ideally go and train, and you know, so so be I less. You're going to say, what are you going to do? Not not train. <laughs> train. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so that's that's kind of an important thing for people to understand. Okay, so this is a good part. We're going to go take a little break here. Uh, But just in sum, if someone has an acute, so sudden onset of pain, they think they're injured, your first advice to them is going to be don't panic. Okay, let's make an assessment. Is this new or old? Have you had it before? What? Let's characterize as best as possible. Are there any red flag signs or symptoms? And then kind of we just go down this path. Do you need to get a physical exam? Does this require imaging? Because if the answer is no, 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 that puts you in a significantly different place than if there's a yes in there. Yeah, exactly. Which we'll talk about after the break. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. Hopefully you guys are enjoying it. I wanted to take a second to talk about GainsRx. GainsRx is now shipping Amazon Prime if you get it on their website. And through our website, you can get a subscription where GainsRx is delivered to your door every month for a $5 discount per tub. The idea is that you take GainsRx pre- and post-workout. It's got all the right ingredients to maximize your performance, improve recovery, and ultimately give you the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to exercise supplementation. A lot of people ask me, hey, Jordan, why did you even make this supplement in the first place? Well, at the time, I was recommending people take all these different supplements. They'd have to get multiple bottles, dose the things properly, and people just weren't doing it. It was too hard to do. So I put it all in one supplement. You take one scoop before, one scoop after, and you're done. So the idea was if you were going to supplement anyway and you wanted to take stuff that was actually going to work, let's put it all in one supplement. We'll put it out on the market and see how it does. There's been a ton of people who have told me that they've gotten great results from it. Looks like things are going well. And so you can get Gains RX at the barbellmedicine.com store or you can get it on Amazon. We really appreciate you guys. And thanks for listening. Make sure that you give us some feedback on our podcasts and we'll catch you guys later. Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. I'm here with Dr. Baraki. We just talked about what to do initially, the first steps in management uh, if you have an acute injury or something starts hurting. Okay. So let's say at this point, our theoretical person has checked no to all those things. That looks like a cat. <laughs> yeah. This guy's been on podcasts before. <laughs> you may, what, what's the cat's name? That's Mr. Pibb. Mr. Pibb. Mr. Pibb <laughs> has no acute musculoskeletal injury at the time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, person has pain. They have no red flag symptoms. They, uh, this is acute. They, um, uh, you know, are wondering, all right, what do we do immediately? So after we've gone through, gotten this history and there are no red flag signs, so no nerve type signs, no yeah, acute neurological, deficit, yeah, no exactly. deficit and weakness, no like massive structural abnormality, like, oh, I wonder if, if I, I fractured, fractured my something. forearm and it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so so almost always my first step is to uh, provide some reassurance and tell people to not panic because by and large, really, truly catastrophic injuries in the weight room or uh, through barbell training are exceptionally uncommon. Um, and so reassurance is the first step. Getting people to not panic is usually a very good first step. The next thing that I try to do is I try to figure out what, what I try to figure out the mechanism of the injury, like what exactly were they doing when it actually hurt, um, so that I can try to piece together in my mind what might have happened, and then afterwards get an assessment of how it's feeling afterwards. As they move around, if they try to move through that range of motion, what do they feel? Is it on average getting better, on average getting worse, like in the minutes and hours uh, and days afterward? Uh, because, you know, again, those kind of send us down these different pathways where if somebody has a tweak, and I can convince them to move through that range of motion and they kind of, you know, uh, they, they can move through it even though they might be a little hesitant or at, at first, but they can say, I can do it and it's not making my pain exceedingly worse to, to do so after after a little while, then hey, I feel relatively reassured. Um, but if they're, if it's, you know, a day or two later and then it's getting worse and worse or moving through those ranges of motion is, is feeling worse and worse, then I'm kind of in a different spot. So that's the subsequent assessment is getting him to move around, 
and kind of seeing what happens with it in the setting of reassurance so that I'm not terrifying them to the point where they're going to perceive way more pain. Again, nocebo effect coming in, but in the context of reassurance and making them feel more comfortable and confident that I don't think that they have just ended their lifting career, right? Which is almost always the case that people will be able to train uh, uh, again. Um, what are they feeling? And that is uh, is kind of the next step that I take. Yeah, I, I think I had a few... <laughs> nuanced layers in here so yeah i do i i'm in a i also do the reassurance thing i actually try to get people to not think about it as much just mainly because if you're hyper focused hyper vigilant about ooh everything that you feel like you'll just invent new symptoms and that's actually been shown you know multiple times over in the literature what i also like to add is some objective metric of pain or function scale. So there are multiple different batteries of tests you can use for, for instance, low back pain, hip, lower extremity pain, you know, whatever you want to use. And I don't find in my practice that any either is more beneficial or less beneficial. It's just like if it's something that I'm dealing with, with a client, uh, then I want to have some number, you know, just to at least, because then I, I like to show improvement, you know, and then because sure. if they see the improvement, like, oh yeah, it does feel better. Right. And, you're like, oh. and, it, and, that, and that works on their brain. You know, that's it. That, that's the interesting piece if, of this. If is you're one you're of my working. clients, don't listen to this. I just ruined the placebo effect for you. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah. and, you know, we, we hate to, to, to say too much about this, you know, in a joking manner because pain pain's you know, number one reason why people go to see their their physician. Anyway, it is very serious. And, you know, um, obviously a lot of secondary outcomes are, have been tragic, uh, particularly in our country. But the mind can do a bunch of crazy things when you get told that you just blew your back out or you shouldn't, you know, <laughs> do this ever again or you're severely injured, you know. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Or you need this particular therapy to get better. You, you effectively, you, you, if you see a, per, uh, a, a professional who says, you need to come see me three times a week to fix this, yeah. that they, they just noceboed you. Yeah, because if you miss one appointment, what starts going through your mind is, oh my God, am I back to square one? Am I going to, you know, what's going to happen to me? You might start perceiving more pain. Yeah. So, right. So you, so, uh, so just to make sure that everyone's on the same page right now, we've got a person who's gone through, uh, they had an acute ish, uh, episode of pain. There were no red flag signs that required them to either go get any imaging or go get a physical exam done. So basically nothing is specific enough that would benefit from either a physical exam by a trained professional or imaging, um, we just have pain, just non-specific pain. It doesn't mean it's not bad and doesn't actually hurt. It's just not specific enough where anything would change by getting more information. Um, so I think your and my recommendation here in general is going to be to continue to train. Yes, avoiding immobility and avoiding those kind of drastic reductions in activity level is super, super important in this situation. And to the extent that you uh, reduce your activity level, um, you know, that will portend uh, worse outcomes in the long run. So you must keep moving and keep doing things. But what, so, but what, what caused the injury in the first place? You know, I, you know so you're, we're on an IG Live or something, and somebody's like, oh, I've got pain in my hip. You're like, well, the hip's yeah. a big area. And they're like, yeah, yeah exactly. I think, you know, uh, I was squatting the other day. You know, yeah, so exactly. what is the mechanism of pain, right? Because I don't want to use mechanism of injury because now you're like, well, for what kind of injury? You know, this is huge, this huge Pandora's box. But mechanism for pain generation, do you find, let's just give you a list, that it's mechanical, all right, but uh, some structural integrity has been compromised, causing pain. Right? Do you find that that is most often the cause of people's pain? And the example would be my knees cave in when I squat. That's why my knees hurt. Uh, typically not. Right. Let's say that. Let's say that again. <laughs> Same as a, a, another good example would be I have a little bit of a little bit of uh, say thoracic rounding when I deadlift. And that's why I have back pain. That's safe. For example. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just get yeah. So 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 we you know we do a several hour long lecture at this at our at the barbell medicine seminar. Pain is you know it's a super interesting topic, but you know you have these kind of peripheral tissue uh, kind of nerve endings and uh, and uh, 
uh, they're called nociceptors that kind of sense that they're they're sensitive to certain mechanical stimuli, and they basically send that signal of me mechanical stimulus up the peripheral nerves, up your spinal cord to your brain, and your brain is tasked with the job of interpreting uh, what do I do with this information. And so, in certain situations, uh, particularly those that are deemed by your brain to be uh, dangerous or threatening, it will actually project pain outwards from the brain so that so that you sense pain in that particular area with the intent that, hey, you stop doing whatever is pissing off that area and you protect it. Um, and so there's a number of ways that this kind of neural circuitry can kind of go haywire, uh, particularly in the setting of chronic or persistent pain. But I think people, so there is a, there is certainly an element of biomechanical factors when it comes to the uh, generation and experience of pain. So there is a role for some of these things, particularly to the extent that they can overload certain tissues beyond their loading capacity. So for example, if you squat and every single rep you have, your knees cave in and almost touch each other and you've been squatting like that for months and the weight's going up and you have some medial knee pain, I could make a case that it is, you know, it makes sense that that might be uh, involved in what's going on. Um, but I wouldn't, so, so what people tend to want to do, particularly lifters who are into the physics and the mechanics and the anatomy and the physiology, they want to ascribe basically all pain that they experience to some mechanical factor, some mechanical deficit, or more often nowadays, some mobility deficit, that I have this pain or that pain because I have inadequate hip mobility, ankle mobility, whatever mobility. And that is almost never the case, where inadequate mobility of something causes pain. Yeah, I would, I, almost, yeah. almost never. I would, I'm trying to think of a case where that would be the case, and I can't, so. <laughs> yeah, so, and I'll actually argue uh, again, so the biomechanical thing is interesting to me because it's almost like you get out, you have a guilt sensation of like, I let myself do this. And this is why I have pain. I think the mechanical cause for pain absent a soft tissue defect. So you've actually done something structurally where like you've torn something or you've, mm -hmm. you've, you know, produced a tendinopathy or co something. Correct. Correct. Actually doesn't cause pain pain even if there is a significant movement issue i think why people get better when they fix their form fix their form is because the weight gets lighter for a period of time so i think that the fatigue generation has outstripped the resources that you have available to cope with recover from yeah. and and deal with and at that point pain is just like this non-specific like oh shit that's that's how i interpret that because you know in there's tons of anecdotal uh, cases where people just have horrid technique but are totally fine. And I think that just speaks to our resiliency as humans. Yeah. You know? And then there are tons Mo of... Most people... Yeah, most people with bad technique don't have pain. Right. right. <laughs> and then there are people with perfect technique who have pain. And, and I'm not saying that this is, you know... Uh, a one-to-one -one correlation or whatever. Like if you have bad technique, you're never going to have pain. But if you have great technique, you're going to have pain. It, it's, it's just that the relationship is not so linear. The, the, the R coefficient between these two things would be not significant enough to make me a believer that the first thing we need to do is fix technique. Although, interestingly, the first thing I would do is assess technique just to see if there was something that I could reasonably say is horribly, horribly wrong. So... Yes, the person who does a 10-second eccentric, you know, the way down on the deadlift with a completely rounded spine that has low back pain. I, I don't think that they're mechanically injuring their spine at that time. I think they're just fatiguing their back in enough, significantly enough, where that causes pain generation to be like, because what, what are the what are the the sequelae of pain uh, of uh, uh, of pain? You have muscle guarding, right? You have a resistance. You get more stiff. Um, for, a low, for a low back pain, and you don't want to do those things again, which would be ultimately how you would dissipate fatigue, right? So that's that's kind of how I how I think of it, um, you know. So, but yeah, I think the first thing you could do in a coaching situation, besides reassure the person that they're not going to die, is if someone comes in and says, "Yeah, look, I have knee pain," you know, every time I squat, I need to see you squat, you know, like. Because there's certainly some cases where you're actually inducing a tendinopathy and that would be more likely to cause pain organically than something else, like a, just too much fatigue. 
you know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this is part of why we take this kind of history, and we want to take a look at uh, the 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 history to date, how it developed, acuity, description, things that make it worse. Because I, I I've developed something of like a like a lifter's what I call lifter's differential diagnosis. The things that when a lifter tells me this hurts. Uh, you know, whether it be a joint or a part of their body, I start to think down this list. So you think the, the way to organize it really in your mind is to think about what are all the things that are necessary in order to execute this movement, uh, that the result of that movement is that this lifter is having some discomfort. So you can think about things like uh, muscle strains, muscle tears can happen, obviously. And so those have their own kind of descriptions, but most people who are listening have an idea in their minds as to what the history of a muscle tear might be, like this acute kind of unzipping type sensation. Oftentimes I've heard it described like that in the pec muscle, for example, followed by a whole bunch of bruising, uh, so probably so, definitely some strength deficit afterwards, things like that. So so muscles are required to lift weights, of course, and so if you have some pain associated with that, they could be involved. Another thing is tendons, because tendons attach your muscles to the bones, and so tendinopathy, which is itself a very broad term, lots of different subtypes, a super interesting topic. We could probably do another whole podcast on tendinopathy. Uh, and then the bones themselves can be involved. So that would be something like if you have osteoarthritis, which is itself not an injury per se, but it's just a, but it can be something that can produce pain in people. Uh, other bony things, fractures, even like a stress fracture, not like a giant, you know, deforming fracture, but a stress fracture, right? <laughs> you have a compound yeah, fracture. Right? Yeah. Why do I have pain? <laughs> exactly. Right. So we've talked about muscles, tendons, bones, uh, nerves can be involved in this stuff. So a nerve entrapment type syndrome. So like a cubital tunnel syndrome, a carpal tunnel syndrome, or a radiculopathy from, uh, from, from, uh, the spine, uh, area. And then, and then, so I've, after all of those, then you start to have weird things. So things like patellofemoral pain syndrome is like this nebulous diagnosis that we don't understand that well, we can't treat very well, um, but it, it doesn't have a very distinct kind of like a pathognomonic finding or something like that that you can see on imaging or exam or something like that. There are some suggestive features and then something like plantar fasciitis would be another example, which is itself like a non-inflammatory type process in the bottom of the foot and it's like, what the whoa, hell is whoa, going whoa. on? Why does it hurt so bad? It yeah. ends with itis. It is not, yes, yeah, oh. that's a misnomer. That's, I was going to say that patellofemoral syndrome was actually the plantar fasciitis of the knee because we're like, we don't really know what's going on. That's why there's so many different treatments for it. None of them work terribly well. Yeah, yeah. So that's in general kind of the things that we try to have to tease out. So this is why, folks, when you ask us on Instagram Live, you say my hip hurts when I squat, you know, and I'm thinking, is this one of their glute muscles or their hip flexors in the front? Is it their tendons that attach any of those muscles to their bones? Is it their hip joint? Is it uh, something, you know, some nervous issue, referred pain from the area? There's like so many different possibilities. And if it's anterior, lateral, or posterior, that changes your diagnosis and what you do with it. So that's why these pain questions are so difficult for us to answer sometimes for people. Yeah, you know, we need to come up with a mnemonic for the, the lifters DDX, right? So like there's the vitamin C for the, for the, right, right. So we need like, we need something. <laughs> yeah, is it, if we could make it like gains somehow, that would be. Yeah, yeah. All right. So look, if you're out there, med students and health professionals, we need yeah. help. <laughs> <laughs> Not, and I don't just mean psychiatric help. Um, so this is another good place uh, to take a break and summarize. So we have this person, acute injury. We've got a thorough history and accounting of the type of pain they're having, the na nature of what it feels like, the uh, associated symptoms, where does it go? Are there any red flag symptoms? Do we need a higher level of care effectively? And once we've ruled that out, we've kind of said, oh, this is acute or chronic, then we start forming this DDX, this differential diagnosis. So do we think it's muscle? Do we think it's a tendon? Do we think it's ligament? Do we think it's something else? Like, uh, <laughs> you know, the other the other portion, in general, if, you, if most of your potential diagnoses are in that other category, I'm gonna say that rely, tends to rely, uh, require a higher level of care. Because then that other category is like, do you have a space occupying lesion? <laughs> like, you know, yeah, it's a tumor. It turned, yeah, no, and you can't juice plus your way out of that one. Like, it's just, <laughs> not how many people can we trigger? No, um, okay, so I think uh, we're at a good stopping place. We're gonna take a break. We'll be right back. The Barbell Medicine Podcast. Catch you guys on the other side. 